I wanted to just uh, just share a few things, a couple announcements, and then I thought take some extra time to pray for our world this morning. There's more people in the balcony than there are on the floor. This is weird. Um, welcome everybody in the balcony um, and everybody on the floor. I don't know where to look. Um, on the table in the back uh, is a whole bunch of different stuff. So there's times where people are like, hey, we haven't really heard anything from the church. And then there's times where, hey, we're hearing too much from the church. This is one of those times where we're just inundating you with information. There is a members packet in the back there as well as our annual report. That's in preparation for our AGM, which is tomorrow night at 7 p.m. If you're a member, uh, we really hope you can make it. It's going to be really important that you do make it uh, in order that uh, we can pass some things that we need to pass according to our constitution and then if you're just if you're not a member but you're interested in uh, seeing how we function and how we do business you are more than welcome to attend and observe and that's tomorrow at seven it's going to be a good time we'll share some reports cast some vision and talk about some things uh, that we hope um, and expect and are praying that God would do in our midst this next year in the back also though I wanted to highlight this and it's called the SCC standard it's a new document that we're publishing once a month uh, campus-wide that is over all of the campuses in the church and what we're doing with this is just unpacking uh, one of the um, statements in our doctrinal statement every month for the next 14 months. I think there's 14 statements in there. And each of the pastors is uh, writing on this. And so three or four of them have written on... Um, on the scriptures and what we believe about in the Bible. And so uh, it's just a really good thing. If you're wondering what we as a church believe about various things, this is a good place to start. It's also online, but I thought uh, there's been a lot of work that's gone into that. Pastor Steve in Sereno is spearheading that. I wanted to highlight that as well. Next week is, uh, it's going to be a cool Sunday. We're going to do some baptisms here. So you're going to want to come out, uh, make sure that you kind of set aside the time for church that day. Baptisms are always a special time in the life of our church where we see the resurrection of Jesus at work as he's changing people's lives as expressed in baptism. And so uh, that'll be next week. And we're going to follow that with a soup and bun. All right. So uh, we're going to have a meal after the second service next week. So probably around noon. Uh, and we just want to put that on your radar. Other than that, uh, I'm just going to invite you to pray. And uh, we're going to pray for our our world and um, the various things that are weighing on our hearts. It's good to be reminded this morning, Jesus, that you are faithful, that you are bound to faithfulness, that you demonstrated faithfulness in being willing to be sent by the Father to pave the way for our redemption and provide for our freedom your faithfulness to redeem so that we might be set free is something we cling to this morning. Especially as we think about and especially as we wrestle with what, what the nature of freedom really is. What it means to, to live without threat to our security, without threat to our autonomy, without threat to our independence. And today, Lord Jesus, I give you thanks for our country, where we can live with a certain degree of assurance that we are free people. We do know that that's not the case around the world, and our heart goes out to the Ukraine this morning. We know your heart breaks over war. We know that you are intimately involved to bring resolution, we know that one day there will be no more war and there will be no more tears and there will be no more death. And we long for that day, Jesus. And we ask that you would enact your faithfulness in coming back, coming back quickly, coming back soon. We look forward to the expressions of our hope that we so cling to now just being realized and knowing that all will be made right. Until that day, Lord Jesus, we commit ourselves to the proclamation of the gospel which will set people free even in the midst of a broken world. We know that the gospel has the power to change lives, that the gospel has the power to stop wars, the gospel has the power to bring the dead back to life. And so I pray for the salvation of President Putin, of 
the governors, of the politicians, Lord, we ask that you would save them and you would change their hearts. Lord, we pray that you would sustain the church in both Russia and Ukraine with your grace as they experience true affliction, true threat. Lord, that you would give them what they need. Our hearts go out to those who are missionaries working in churches, working in orphanages, working in NGOs, and ask, Lord, that you would protect them and that you would give them ample opportunity, as we know you have, to serve the people, to demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel. We pray for our country as well, Lord. We pray that you would bring salvation to our prime minister, to our premier. Lord, that you would um, uh, demonstrate your goodness and your grace in that respect as well, Lord. As we seek to submit to them, because your word calls us to do that, knowing that in our submission we are worshiping you. And we are trusting you. And as we open up your word this morning, Lord, we do so grateful that we have the chance to do it without fear of censorship at this time or threat of any kind. So, Lord, would your spirit come and move and speak? We do not take for granted this opportunity to listen to you and to worship you. And in not taking it for granted, Lord, we, we have an expectation that you will use it to change our hearts, to deepen our faith, to strengthen our hope, and to increase our love. In your name we pray, amen. In turning your Bibles to Ruth chapter 4, we're in the second to last sermon in this book, and it's a book in the Old Testament all about redemption. And redemption is a big word, it's a doctrinal word that, that sometimes just needs maybe a simple definition, and to be redeemed is to be set free. To be redeemed is to, to see God's activity in our lives, to bring about our freedom. When we talk about redemption, even the redemption in, in the world, we're, we're looking for that. We're looking for the powers that are at work against people to be destroyed so that people would live free. And we're reminded, as I hope we've been reminded, that, that God is working towards our redemption. That God has a plan and it is always about setting us free because God cares about our freedom. God cares deeply about our freedom and therefore has given us the hope of redemption in all things for all time. This is what we as Christians cling to. This is where we find peace and joy. It's where we find hope and where we find love in believing that God is doing what he says he's going to do and it will be for our freedom and not just for our freedom but for the freedom of the whole world. It is important to remember though that the forces that are working against us are powerful. And I want to identify, actually just remind you of three of them. Sin and Satan and death. These are the powers that are at work in our lives, in our circumstances, and in our world to enslave us. And they are the most powerful forces in the universe apart from the gospel. Right? But they are powerful. Sin and Satan and death. And you say, I know, Ben, you talk about this all the time because we need to be thinking about the power of sin and the power of Satan and the power of death. We need to be praying about where those powers are at work in our lives so that we might live in freedom from them. The greatest threat to our freedom is not government. The greatest threat to our freedom is sin and Satan and death, which can work amongst the authorities within the world. But for us, what we see is that now, where I'm living now, I need to be aware of my propensity towards sin, my, my um, inability to often discern the lies of Satan and the fear that I have of death. These things enslave us. These are the things that are waging war against our soul. These are the things that are waging war not just against our soul but against our body. These are not things that are not waging just war against our, our body, our soul, but also against our eternity. And so when we as Christians claim a hope, it is a hope that is realized now in the belief that Jesus, through his death on the cross and subsequent resurrection, has defeated the powers that are waging war against us. God cares about our freedom from what? From sin and from Satan and death. The Bible is story after story of God enacting this plan of redemption to bring about freedom, true freedom. I like the way one author put it, that the necessity and provision of redemption is at the very heart of God's plan and the plan of his heart. 
What's our hope in the world? Is that God is working towards redemption of us as individuals and then through us to the whole world. That is God's plan. That is God's, God's purpose. That is God's care. That is God's love. How do we know that to be true? The cross. The cross. The cross is where the power of sin was destroyed so that we could live without condemnation. It's where the lies of Satan were revealed so that we could walk in the truth. It's where death died so that we could live not just new lives but eternal lives. Sin and Satan and death are the things that are waging war against us. They're the powers that are seeking to enslave us. They are the three of the four most powerful forces in the universe, but the greatest power is the gospel. And so we cling to that. And we find our peace and hope and love and joy, i.e. our freedom in that. So that whatever comes across us in this world we know cannot control us, that we're free. God authors redemption. He works it on our behalf. That's what we're reading about in the book of Ruth, an Old Testament story where um, two women are enslaved to their circumstances and to their culture. And we know that the force that was at work in their life was death, wasn't it? That the men, that they're they were supposed to take care of them because they lived in a culture that, that demanded that men take care of women, right? That, that the death of those men brought them to a place of poverty and of slavery. But God, working in the midst of circumstances, out of love for each of them as individuals, brings about redemption. And it's beautiful. We're going to see the climax of the story today where Boaz accomplishes redemption for Ruth and Naomi. And what I want us to see then is the nature of redemption. Next week, we're going to talk about um, the effects of redemption, but today, the nature of redemption. And there's four things that we're going to note there. Uh, they are this, that redemption, divine redemption is inevitable, that divine redemption is personal, that divine redemption is sufficient, and divine redemption is obvious. Okay, those four things. I'm going to hit them really quick and then talk about false redeemers and talk a little bit about what it means to see this redemption at work in our lives and then finally uh, look again at the redemption that Jesus has purchased for us. So let's read uh, Luke chapter 4. I'm going to start in verse 1 and down through verse 10. Boaz went to the gate of the town and sat down there. Soon the family redeemer Boaz had spoken about came by. Right? So you remember a couple of weeks ago, Boaz has committed to Ruth that he will be a redeemer, but that there was a closer relative right, that had first right of refusal, basically. And that's, what's, that's who's being referred to here. Boaz, Boaz says, come over here and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took men of the town's elders and said, sit here. And they sat down. He said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has returned from the territory of Moab, is selling the portion of the field that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should inform you. Buy it back in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, do it. But if you do not want to redeem it, tell me so that I will know because there isn't anyone other than you to redeem it and I am next after you. I want to redeem it, he answered. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from Naomi, you will acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the deceased man, to perpetuate the man's name on his property. The Redeemer replied, I can't redeem it myself or I will ruin my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption because I can't redeem it. At an earlier period in history, a man removed a sandal and gave it to the other party in order to make a matter legally binding concerning the right of redemption or the exchange of property. So instead of a handshake, they just swapped shoes. All right? That might be a little bit better than the elbow tap. I'm not totally sure, but anyways. Where were we? Oh, yeah, verse 8. So the Redeemer removed his sandal and said to Boaz, Buy back the property yourself. Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses today that I am buying from Naomi everything that belonged to Elimelech, Chilion, and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow as my wife, to perpetuate the deceased man's name on his property so that his name will not disappear among his relatives or from the gate of his hometown. You are witnesses today. This is God's word. God's plan is always about the redemption of people and therefore the redemption uh, of all of creation. Uh, we know, we've looked at how the law, the law was there to protect the people in, in order that they might hold on to the land that they had inherited, that God who owned the land was 
giving to them and that that land would stay within the family for generation after generation after generation. The law in the Old Testament in this situation was very concerned about in making sure that the land stayed within the families and that those families continued, right? A continuation of the, uh, of the family and, the, and uh, the inheritance being passed down uh, was the purpose behind the law. But there's a principle that we know about the law, that the law can maybe can protect, but it cannot save. The law can protect, but it cannot save. In order for Naomi and Ruth to be saved, they needed a redeemer. Redemption always comes with a person. Okay? It always comes with a purpose, person. So the law can protect, but it cannot save. Now what's going on here is, is, seems to be complicated, but it, but it is relatively simple. At least I'm going to try to make it sound relatively simple. Um, Naomi still has a right to land, that Elimelech owned land that uh, we don't really know what happened with it. That may be where Ruth and Naomi are living, but she is a landowner. At the same time, she's living impoverished and needs to sell the land, and we know that there was provision in the law for her to one day buy that land back, or maybe better said, an heir to be able to buy that land back. So the culture of that day, uh, the people of that day knew that, that in order to uh, set yourself free, you could sell a portion of your land, but you would have right to buy that land back. Now we know that the heart of men was evil and sinful and greedy, and the law probably didn't work out well every single time, but, but in this case, we see it actually work effectively. A close relative has first right to redeem that land. Okay? This would have been maybe a first cousin, maybe a second cousin. We're not told, but we do know that this one, this anonymous one, does have a right to the land. And so Boaz puts him on the spot. Don't know why he didn't step up further. Don't know why he didn't ask for the land sooner. But he's just maybe hearing that Naomi is ready to sell the land. So Boaz puts him on the spot and says, she's ready. Are you going to buy it? And of course he says yes. He's not really thinking, but he says yes. Oh, I would love to have it. And Boaz is like, okay, but you also have to marry Ruth. And that's where things get complicated for this anonymous redeemer. Why? He's probably already married, right? And so he thinks, well, I can't buy land and then take home a new wife. This isn't going to go well for me. This isn't the balancing act that works in marriage. I got some land, but, right, it's not going to work out that way. Plus, he knows then that he's also going to have to provide an heir through Ruth who will get that land as his inheritance later on, Okay? So the child to be born would have the right to that land himself. And so he was basically purchasing it to give it back one day. Isn't it crazy? It's not very capitalistic, is it? You know? But that's not the point. God is concerned about maintaining the family's right to the land and continuing the family's line. And so we see the false redeemer, false redeemer back off. I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. He refuses to do that. And Boaz steps up and says, I will do it. I will redeem the land. I will marry Ruth. I will provide an heir. Right? And in that, Ruth and Naomi's redemption is complete. They're set free from poverty. They're set free from circumstances. In a way, though their hearts have been, have been affected by the death of those they love, they've been set free from how that death has affected their lives right? And a really powerful thing, many of you know when you experience death of, of someone that you're attached to and close to, that your life will never be the same again. That's why when a lot of people plan their lives, when they have pictures of how they would like to see their life progress, they never really take into account somebody dying, right? At all. That's always a tragedy, and we weren't experienced to create, to experience death We weren't created to experience death. And so when it does come, it does. It changes the trajectory of our lives. And a lot of people know that 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 changes everything. For Ruth and Naomi, it brought about poverty. They were going to be set free from their poverty and given the chance to live a new life. That's the power of redemption. I want us to look just for a moment at those four aspects of, of Boaz's redemption and parallel that with Christ's redemption of us. Those four things. First of all, it's inevitable. Okay. Boaz committed to doing it in chapter 3. Ruth comes to him. 
appeals to him and he commits, I will redeem you. I will work towards that end. He's going to submit to the law. He's going to make sure that nothing is going to threaten that. So he's going to appeal to the first redeemer. It may have been that he always had planned to marry Ruth and have an heir. And that heir would, even if that closer redeemer, that heir would, you know, had purchased the land, that heir would still have right to it later on. But, but we do know, regardless, Boaz was going to do what he could to do it. It was inevitable. In the same way, God's redemption is inevitable. God is trustworthy. Do you believe that? Right? He's going to do what he says he's going to do. When? Don't know. Right? A lot of people want to know, when's the world going to end? Don't know. Is the world going to come to an end? To a certain degree, yes. Everything will change. Right? People wonder why I don't preach about the end times very much. That's come up. That's been brought to me a number of times. Why don't you preach about the end times more, Ben? Time and time and time again. I think I preach about it every week. But here's what we know. Jesus is coming back. Right? It's inevitable. The redemption we have in Christ right now is inevitable. That we can live free of sin and Satan and death now. And we look forward to the day when all of creation will be redeemed. Do you see the parallels there? That what Boaz does is he redeems individuals and sets the land aside for the air. That is continued in the cross and in the gospel, right? Where God sets individuals free as a a means by which to give them hope that one day he, we know he will set the whole world free. God still cares about the land. He still cares about all of creation. And he redeems us moving towards that, which reminds us that the redemption is personal. It's for the whole world, but it can be experienced individually. Isn't that awesome? God loves you individually. That's what's great about this story is it's about two ordinary people living really difficult lives that God is working for on their behalf, right? There would be no denying for Ruth and Naomi, after all of this had taken place, that God loved them. It was personal. It was personal. And in being personal, it became sufficient. So Boaz not only buys back the land, not only sets them free from the poverty, but actually marries Ruth because he loves her. And she gets a new life. It's sufficient, not just in the transaction, but also in the covenant of love. Man, this is what God does. He doesn't just pay the penalty for our sins. He invites us to live a new life in a sufficient grace that changes our reality, where we can know that we are loved by God, that the God of the universe is working for us because he loves us. Not because he's obliged but because he wants to. It's a big deal. It's huge. God wants to work redemption in our lives because he loves us and he's done enough. It was enough, right? Ruth, you know, she could have married Boaz because he was obliged or even this other redeemer because he was obliged, but she would have never known love. But Boaz, because he loved Ruth, gave her a new life where she was completely secure and safe, not because she had a home, but because she had someone who cared for her. Her redeemer was the lover of her soul. Our redeemer is the lover of our soul. You don't need a love apart from this. All other loves pale in comparison to this. The greatest love we can get on this earth is a love that pushes us towards the love of Jesus. That's the greatest love we can give. Husbands, you cannot love your wife enough so that she doesn't need God's love. Wives, you cannot love your husbands enough so that they don't need the love of God. Singles, you can have the full love of God and not have a diminished life. His love is enough. He's covered. It's sufficient. And then it's obvious. It's maybe a small thing, but I think it's a really big thing that, that Boaz does this publicly, right? This isn't a private affair. He's going to do this so that everybody can see it. And in those next verses that we're going to look at next week, the people celebrate God's redemption through the grace of Boaz. It's obvious for everybody to see right? God's work is a public 
work. God's work is an obvious work. There's accountability in that. Accountability, right, for Boaz so that God's grace can be celebrated. The people saw it. Boaz makes this commitment publicly. Hey, you all need to know I'm doing this. And you hold me accountable for fulfilling the law. Isn't that awesome? He doesn't do it in private so that he can renege on it. Christianity is a series of public confessions. When we take communion together, we are doing this publicly, right? Did you know that? It's not just a private act. It's a public act. When we have you come forward, you are testifying to your belief in Jesus' death on your behalf, right? You're telling the church, I believe this. And in so doing, you may not know it or not, but you're being accountable for that, right? That our lives will line up for it. That's why it's a very important thing that we don't take it flippantly. Public confessions, that's why baptism really matters. You're telling the world, you're telling the church, you're telling Satan, I belong to Christ. I belong to Christ. I'm identifying with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. I belong to Jesus. That's why Satan attacked Jesus with lies after his baptism, because it was public at that point. There's a lot more I could say on that. If you're going to have a lot more questions, you can email me. Ben at a place to belong. That's my actual email address, right? If you have questions about that or anything, about why I don't preach about the end times more, go for it. Why did it need to be obvious? So that God would receive glory. So that God would be glorified, because this was God's work. God's work to provide the law as a provision, but to work in Boaz's heart to secure it. God's work in the law and in the person brought about redemption. That's why when we look and we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, right? And that his atoning sacrifice was enough to fulfill the prophecy in order to make this personal for each one of us. We look and we see that Boaz is a front runner of Christ. The people saw it, God was glorified. That was beautiful. Titus 2, passage we're going to look at a little bit more next week, says this, We are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. We're looking forward to the day when Christ will bring about redemption and we will, we will recognize that redemption because we've already experienced it. The promise of Titus 2 is that the, the redemption can be now from all lawlessness, from the power of sin and Satan and death, we can live free. We can live free regardless of what else is going on in the world if we follow Christ as our redeemer and reject all false redeemers. So that's the contrast we have here, right, is we have a false redeemer. We have a false redeemer who is reluctant, not responsible. We have a false redeemer who is looking for a transaction, but not a personal relationship. We see a false redeemer whose actions are insufficient, not sufficient. He wanted to do as little as possible. And did you notice that we don't know his name? Because all false redeemers are forgotten and not praised. There's provision in the law that day that if you were to reject the possibility to redeem, your name would be stricken from all the genealogies. That's how important God treated this matter. This man is forgotten and not praised. He's in the story, but he remains nameless. A false redeemer will do all of that, will be reluctant to save, will treat it transactional, not personal. His work will be insufficient, and it'll be forgotten. So let us ask ourselves, what are some of the false redeemers? What are some of the places we look to for freedom from sin and Satan and death that aren't Jesus? Okay, well, there's primary ones, right? Relationships. If we're looking for a spouse, a child, or a friend to make us happy, to give us a sense of satisfaction, we're looking to a false redeemer because that's a burden no one can bear. When we equate the peace in our circumstances with freedom, we're in danger of living in slavery. A lot of people get stuck in the idea that if I can just change my season, change my location, change my station, then I will be free. 
They're always seeking out the next thing when things change, right? Haven't we been saying that for two years? When things get back to normal, right? Then we'll be free. COVID was never a threat to our freedom. Did you know that? Ever. We have the gospel. We're free. We're always free, right? There's no normal that is going to make us free, that is going to save us. The obvious false redeemer is often ourselves, that when we look at our lives and we look for solutions, answers, or validations, we're actually living in slavery. If I can just figure out why what happened happened, then maybe I can solve it. I meet a lot of people who really struggle with that, that they've diagnosed the problem and then they prescribe the solution. Or they have people in their life who are diagnosing their problem and prescribing their solution. Do you have people like that in your life? I know what your problem is. Here's what you need to do. Like, ah, oh, no. The answer is not diagnosing the problem and finding the solution. The answer is clinging to Jesus. And that's not spiritual talk I'm talking about. It's the real thing, right? Jesus may reveal our problem. He may show us our sin. He may show us the lie. He may show us our fears. And in so doing, we can find in him the one who can set us free from a sin, from shame and from addiction. The one who does show us the truth that we can speak to Satan and, and confront his lies. And the one who gives us hope that even as we face an inevitable death, we don't have to live fearful of it because there's always the possibility of resur resurrection. Diagnosing problems to find solution is a slavery that many of us are aware of. And, and I get why that is appealing, because it gives us a sense of control, doesn't it? It gives us a sense of control. But Jesus is the one who has all control, and he is the one who is going to enact his purposes regardless of whether or not we see it. God is working for our good all the time. We don't have to worry about diagnosing and prescribing a solution. We just have to look to Jesus and believe what he's saying to us now. Which of those is at work against you? Sin? Shame? Satan and his lies? Right? Death? I know that each one of you is wrestling with one or more of those three because they're always at work against us. And Jesus says, the truth of me will set you free. Where is freedom? It's in the truth of Christ and in him alone. Jesus and his gospel is more powerful than anything, including our sinful desires, including the lies of Satan, including death. And when we give our lives to Christ, that power comes and actually indwells us, lives inside of us. How do we live free? When we live by the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom. When we place our faith in Christ, when we admit our helplessness, when we cry out to Him for deliverance, when we live lives of repentance, hating our sin but loving Him and seeking to uh, just identify as a member of His family, we are being directed by the Holy Spirit and we are always free. Freedom is found when the Spirit is indwelling us and guiding us into all truth and is leading us in the footsteps of Christ that we might glorify Him and see His power at work in our lives. It's always there if the Spirit is with us. And Jesus has done everything possible to do that. Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin. Jesus died to expose the lies of Satan. Jesus died the death that we were condemned to. And he rose to life by the power of the Spirit. And in so doing, gave us that same power that we might live beyond those things that are trying to kill us. Man, it's awesome. How do we, do, how do we get there? Awareness. We need to admit we're not free. We need to confess. I'm helpless, Lord. Please help me. We need to repent. Grieving our sin, hating our slavery, and crying out to God for love. And then restoration. Believe this. Three things. If we could just believe, I'm delivered, I'm accepted, and I have authority in Christ. Parents, teach your kids those three things. I'm delivered, I'm accepted, and I have authority in Christ. 
And it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. You'll always be free. And then reconciliation, live in a loving relationship with the Father. I am loved, and I live loving him in return. For Ruth and Naomi, their freedom was directly connected to their redemption. And at the end of it, they were no longer slaves. And it's the same for us. But know this, freedom is found only in the redemption of Christ. Let me leave you with these promises. What has Jesus redeemed us from and redeemed us to? In very specific ways, this. Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law to live transformed lives by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Jesus has redeemed us from Satan and his demons to have authority of Christ given to us that we might stand in it. Jesus has redeemed us from the lies of guilt and shame to new life made possible by the forgiveness of all of our sins. Jesus has redeemed us from our sinful flesh to live a new life of freedom by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has redeemed us from being dead to God and alive to sin to being dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Freedom, the truth of the gospel at work on our behalf. Why? Because God's plan is always for our redemption. It's an obvious work. We can expect it. We can look for it. We can see it in our lives and in the lives of others. As we grieve war, as we share concern about government overreach, as we pray for future generation, we do so knowing that redemption has come and is coming. That's the only hope. That as we grieve war, that as we worry about your overreach, that as we pray for, out of concern for future generations, we know this, that redemption has come and is coming. And that until all of creation is free, we can be free today if we trust in Jesus, if we see that Jesus is our kinsman redeemer, one like us but unlike us, with the power to save us and the desire to save us. It's only him, it's only ever going to be him for all time and for all of eternity. Jesus' redemption will not be destroyed. That sin and Satan and death will no longer have any power or stronghold in all of eternity at Christ's return. But until that day, we can live in the surety that now I don't have to be controlled by anything. Because Jesus is at work in my life on my behalf, setting me free. Isn't this the message that the world needs to hear? Isn't this what we should be standing in front of A&W and shouting? Jesus can set you free. He wants to set you free. It's the only thing that's going to set you free. And he's here right now making it possible for each one of us to know this. He loves us. And he's done enough. And we can be at rest. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, move. Move with the power of salvation. Lord, we struggle with addiction in this room. We struggle with shame in this room. We know that we're controlled by lies. We know that we're afraid of death. Lord, we know that our faith is being challenged in all of those different areas. We know that there are times where we are distracted, believing that our freedom is something to be accomplished instead of trusting that it already has been. Lord, would you bring about this spiritual reality that it might grant us a peace that we are so desperate for, that our world is so desperate for, and that the world would see it. Oh, that we would submit to the authority of your word, to the authority of your power, knowing that by that, by that power, we are loved. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have in you one who is not only willing to pay the transaction for our salvation, but also to love us in the midst of it all. We do not take it for granted. And even today, Lord, as we, as we rest in you, the sufficiency of the gospel with gratitude by taking communion together, we do so rejecting any false redeemer of looking to anyone to provide us with a freedom that only you can provide us with. And Lord, that it would just do a work in our hearts that would make us different, distinct. Spirit, minister here in new life. Jesus, be glorified in our words and our deeds. In your name I pray. Amen.